Praise the Lord. All right, so up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. Thank you very much for this convention. We thank you because we know we are moving forward. Thank you for your grace on our pastors, on our leaders. Thank you, Lord, for your grace on all our overseers. Thank you for these members of the choir. Thank you for the sacrifice you helped them to put in. And thank you because they have a heart to come and minister to us. And this year, they've given us the very best. And we're praying, Lord, as they give us the best, you give them the best in their lives and families in Jesus' name. Amen. All our leaders, all our pastors, all our overseers, all our ushers, all the prayer warriors, everybody, Lord, everyone contributing to this program that we're enjoying your, our fellowship here and we're enjoying the presence of the Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray you shower your blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, we cannot overlook uh, the build, this building here, the sacrifice, the giving that all of us have participated in. And Lord, all those who have been walking behind this, uh, the scene, that they have put all this together. Every time we remember them, even after this convention, we know that we're going to be praying for them. We're going to remember them for good. And Lord, we pray that you help every one of us to join hearts and hands together so that we can continue to move this work forward in Jesus' name. Amen. We're grateful to you. We're happy with one another. We love you, Lord. We want to love you more. Thank you for what you are doing through us. We pray you'll do more in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray that this morning you crumble our will. And, oh, Lord, we pray you crush the eye, the self in every one of us. Amen. And you move us forward that, Lord, even though the cross may be great, by your grace, we're going to serve you. Amen. And we'll serve you till the very end in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding to see what we ought to see. And to see that monster within each of us. So that, Lord, we'll release that monster to you. And that monster will be crushed crucified, conquered, and then will be free to serve you without any hindrance. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We praise the name of the Lord for bringing us together once again. I want you to realize that the session we come to now is referred to as Bible teaching. This morning we're talking about something very important, crucified consecrated and commissioned, crucified, consecrated and commissioned. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, this, by the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. As you look at this verse, you're going to see something here very important. Number one, the crucified. Number two, the consecrated. And number three, the commission. Number one, I am crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. And then it says, nevertheless, I live. I consecrate myself, now that self is crucified, I consecrate myself unto the Lord. It says, not I, but Christ liveth in me. There's a continual outworking of the grace of God in this man, in Paul the Apostle. Crucified, number one, and then consecrated, number two. And then he says, now I'm commissioned, I'm doing something. I am living for the Lord. I'm laboring for the Lord. I'm loving the people because of the Lord. Then it says, and the life which I now live. I live in the flesh. I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Now you will see that these, uh, there are three things here. Number one is the crucifixion. Number two is a consecration. Number three is a commission. And they follow after one another. And when you change the order, you're not going to be successful. If, for example, you are not crucified and you just take the commission. If, for example, you are not consecrated and you just take the commission. Or maybe, for example, you want to be consecrated but you are not crucified. You'll find it very much impossible. But number one is the crucifixion. 
Number two is the consecration. Number three is the commission. Crucified, consecrated, and commissioned. Each of us is precious and can be tremendously profitable to God and profitable to man. But you know, there's something within us that will hinder our usefulness, our profitability. And what is that? Is a carnality within us. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading to you from verse 6. In Romans chapter 8 verse 6. Here is what it says. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded. That if there's carnality within. Now you need to understand. There's carnality. There's worldliness. And there are many people that deal with worldliness, but they don't deal with carnality. But we have to deal with both. Number one, deal with that worldliness. I don't know whether you are reading all that we have in your uh, program uh, booklet. You ought to get that booklet and then you read everything there. In one of the statements there, it says, the church is so worldly and the world is so churchy that we cannot tell the difference now. You'll find it if you read it. And uh, sometimes there are people that say, no, we're not going to go along with the world or the church that is so worldly. But, and they're dealing with the worldliness, but they're not dealing with the carnality. And it says over here in verse 6, it says to be carnally minded. It's death. But it's when that carnal mind or that carnality itself, when it is crucified, then it says you are, that carnality is dead. And you are spiritually minded that gives you now life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind is enmity against God. There's a deep-rooted enmity for the watch of God. For the principle of righteousness. It's like, although we hear, although we have attending meetings, and yet there's no change and there's no turning around. There's no transformation. It says to be carnally minded is death. And then because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. What does that mean? The carnal mind is a law to itself. And therefore it is lawless. And it will not yield itself, submit itself, surrender itself to the watch of God. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's why we need to get crucified. That is the self in us to be crucified. After the crucifixion, then there will be a consecration. After the consecration, there will be a commission. And it's only the crucified who is emptied of self that can be of much use in the kingdom of God. And the, the subject or the message divides itself to three parts naturally. Number one, crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. Number two, consecrated to Christ. Consecrated to Christ. Number three, commissioned by Christ. Commissioned by Christ. Number one. What's number one? Crucified with Christ. Let's come back to this. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I want you to pick up that letter I. And it says it's the I that is crucified with Christ. I crucified with Christ. As you think about these words, which are really the great problems that we human beings have, the first word is sin. S I N. What's the middle letter there? I. And sin is Satan's imparted nature. S I N. Satan's imparted nature. You see, it, it is that I, the nature of Satan, that says, I am, nobody else is. I am, and nobody else will be heard. I am, and nobody else will be seen. I am, and nobody else matters. The I that sits at the very middle is the very nature of Satan. Why is seen Satan's imparted nature? You look at Isaiah chapter 14, and you are going to see the language of Satan. 
And that will show you the nature of Satan. That will show you the attitude of Satan. That will show you the ambition, aspiration of Satan. And when you have that aspiration, that ambition, that attitude, and that, that's the very center of that word seed. That's why the apostle said, if we're going to be useful at all in the kingdom of God, I am crucified with Christ. In, in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art, how art thou cut down to the ground? With deeds weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart. For thou hast said in thine heart. It's a nature. It's the attitude within. It's the aspiration within. It's the ambition within. Thou hast said in thine heart. Your self talk. What are you telling yourself? When you see other people do something, what ideas come to your mind? That will tell you whether you are promoting yourself exalting yourself and then whether you have this eye the very center of sin it says here in verse 13 for thou hast said in thine heart i will ascend into heaven you see the everything is about i i will exalt my throne above the stars of god again i will siege also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now you can see that I, and that's what Paul the Apostle is saying. He's saying, before you can be consecrated and commissioned, there's one thing that ought to happen. I am crucified with Christ. Now, as you read this, what do you see? And he mentioned the word ego. That's what you see here. And what is ego? Write down ego. E-G-O ego you know what that is edging god out edging god out in your in your ambition in your aspiration in everything that you say everything that you think it's i it's i you edge god out that's ego and when that ego is there that's empty that's shallow and that is going to be under the judgment of God. Let's come back to this again in verse 13. But I said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. It's mine. Me. My. Mine. And you know there are people that if, they do that every time. And then when they talk to you, or they say, my church. Is that your church or his church? And then they say, my church building. Is that your church building or his church building? They possess everything. That possessive attitude. That ambition. Even that language that comes out every time. Even when you are talking of something that only God can do. And only God has done. You claim all the things to yourself. You edge God out. And even though you might even mention God, and you might even mention some spiritual things, but you're sitting on the throne, and you are. In fact, uh, people fear you more than they fear God. They honor you and respect you more than they respect God. And some of the things that are put down, and some of the things that are put in place, is either just yourself, or your wife, or your children, nobody else. And it's like you're sitting on that throne, even in the house of God. And that the Lord is telling, and no matter how much you talk about consecration, about commission, and about every other thing you're doing, oneself has not been crucified. And that's the beginning point. After you are born again, self has to, be, has to be crucified. And you can tell when you come into a church, you can tell when you come into a group of people, the individuals there. And that's why we have, that's why we have problems. Ego fighting against ego, knocking against ego, having friction with one another. I want to sit there, you are sitting there. I want to stand there, you are standing there. I want to be the one that is known, and you are the one projecting yourself. That's why we're having a problem. He's taking my place, and he's doing what I should be doing. And it's not, he doesn't know that I am there and I ought to be there. And it's wonderful when you can come to the Lord and that ego is gone. 
I said that ego is gone. And also the I is crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Uh, what's this in the life of in the life of Lucifer? Satan is pride. I will. I will. I will exalt myself. Can you write that word down? Pride. What's the center of that word? I. You know when you are nobody else, and the idea you have that's always the best idea. The opinion you have that's always the best opinion. And the place you are going, that's always the best place to go. And the way you are doing things, that's the best way to do it. And if another person does anything better than you have done it, you put him down. You say, no, it cannot be. Because I am and nobody else. If anybody else tries to do anything, even if, if everybody knows that this is better, this is, this is higher. We're well, going to say, yes, but you don't know their secret life. You don't know this. We're going to find something to discredit them. And it's the nature of Satan. It's because sin is Satan's imparted nature. And once that is there, there's no crucifixion yet. And you're going to even doubt the conversion. If yourself, yourself has not been crucified. And you know these people that commit crime? There's a lot of crime. Write that word crime. The word crime. What's the center of that? It's the I. They don't care about anybody's life. They don't care about anybody's sorrow. Anybody's suffering. Anybody's crime. Whatever. Even uh, uh, if they want to commit rape, they only think about themselves. If they are thinking about stealing, they think about themselves. If they want to blow down a bridge or blow down anything, they are thinking about just themselves. It is that I that has the center of sin, as the center of pride, at the center of crime. And you know, sometimes uh, you're looking at somebody and he says, I'm born again, and he's an adult, he's uh, maybe in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s or the 80s. But the way he's acting, you say, this fellow is acting like a child. You know, so childish. Always talking about himself. Always wanting to di divert every conversation to just self. Everything that he does, every projection he has is just about self. You say, this is a child. Although he's grown up as a man, as a woman, this is a child. Can you write the word child? Write that down. Now you understand where I'm going? What's that? Where's the middle? Oh, and the child does not care for whether the mother has been having sleeplessness or not. The mother is tired. The mother is weary. You know, the, the child just wants what he wants, whenever he wants it, and it doesn't matter whether we have the resources or not. He's a child. I is at the center of a child. And when you are childish like that, I is the center of your life. And what the Lord is saying is that if we're going to be useful in the community and we're going to be useful in the kingdom of God, bring this I, this child inside, this pride inside, this crime inside, this sin inside, bring it unto the Lord. And there's a word that they don't use very commonly. It's a very rare word, but I'll give it to you. The word is hardiness. Hardiness. Write that down. It's not H-A-R. It's H-A-D-D. H-A-D-D-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Hardiness. Hardiness. Have you written that? What's the middle of that word? You know, uh, there's some people that are just hard and tough to deal with. And you can, although they may, they may even be, you know, like teenagers, but the hardiness is there. And the resistance is there. And when you are talking to them, or you are trying to counsel them, you are trying to advise them, you are actually knocking your head against a very strong wall. And you say, although this one is a child. I wonder why a child can be so hardy, can be so, uh, can be so stubborn, can be so tough, that we can a single word cannot even penetrate. And then, and the child, you know, is so trained himself. He's not going to fight. He might not even frown. He's so well trained that he, after you said everything you want to say, well, just say, thank you, sir. But I will do what I will do. That's hardiness. Or sometimes it's a lady. And ladies normally have gentle nature. Ladies normally have soft nature. And there are some ladies, they don't fight. 
these ladies, they don't, you, they don't really argue with you. And then you say, uh, you assume that they are Christians. And you assume that they, they, they want to go to heaven. You assume that because they keep on coming to this church. And they are about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You are assuming that they, they want to hear the word of God. And you have been patient. You have preached it. You preach it directly. You preach it indirectly. You preach it with love. You preach it with wisdom. You preach it in convention. You preach it in the church. And you preach it with every style. And, and the lady is still like she is. And then you say, I think I need to go a step forward. Am I afraid of her? Why am I not talking to her? Then you say, uh, sister, can I see you after the service? And she says, yes. Very respectful. They will not argue with you. And then after they have come, and uh, you, you know, you sit down, you say, how are you? You are born again? Yes, I praise the Lord. And you love this. I see you've been coming to this church for a long time. Yes, I've been coming for a long time. Can I discuss any subject with you? Oh, Pastor, you're free. You can discuss anything. And then, you know, you go on, you open the Bible, you, and you see you swallow up and wisdom and everything. And then after you're finished, and she doesn't get angry, and she doesn't frown at you, and she doesn't do anything, she just smiles and says, thank you, Pastor. You have anything to say? No, thank you, Pastor. Do you agree with, uh, you know what, uh, you know, I've read to you from the Bible, thank you, Pastor. And uh, how do you, is there going to be a change? Thank you, Pastor. No anger, no frowning of the face. And then she goes away. And the next time you see her, exactly the same thing. Hardiness. That the mind is tough. And that's what the Lord is saying. Bring that to the cross. And it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. You know, that hardiness is the stubbornness within. It's the eye that is standing at the very center. And the Lord is saying, get rid of it today. And it's going to be done. I said it will be done. Because there's going to be the crucifixion. Let me show you some examples. In 1 Samuel chapter 13. For Samuel chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 11. For Samuel chapter 13, reading from verse 11. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered for me. I saw, I knew the demand, I knew the commandment, I knew what you told me earlier, but I, I saw. And that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines scattered themselves uh, together at Michmash. Therefore said I, it's the I. That's what the problem of Saul. If you heard any time that Saul was the first king of Israel, but he lost the kingdom, it's I. Because of that uncrucified I. The eye that will not be crucified. That's why then it says, then said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me. I to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself. That's the problem. I did it. And I did it deliberately. I knew what I was doing. I had to do it. And I forced myself because I wasn't considering you. I wasn't considering God. I wasn't considering the word of God. All I considered was just myself. And if you're like that, anytime you're taking decision, anytime you're doing anything, you don't consider any other thing, any other one, except yourself. I forced myself, therefore, and I offered the offering. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. Which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Actually, the Lord was testing Saul, and he failed the test. You know why he failed the test? Because self was not crucified in verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. I pray that your kingdom will continue. I pray that your blessing will continue. Uh, but you know why, uh, sometimes why, uh, many people lose what the Lord has given them because of that I. Not crucified. But he says, I am crucified. In 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. 
and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Again, that tells us the receipts are at problem. He said, yes, I know I, I, I did it with my eyes open. I did it with the word of God knocking at my door saying, so, so, why are you, what are you doing? He said, yes, I know what I was doing. I know I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. But now look at the next verse. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my my sin and turn again with me that i may worship the lord and samuel said unto saul i will not return with thee all you were all he still wanted was this a public recognition and let's jump down to verse 30 then he said i have sinned yet honor me now i have sinned yet honor me now i'm not honoring the lord but honor me I'm not obeying the Lord, but honor me. I'm disregarding the word of God. Yes, I know, but honor me. I need honor. I need appreciation. I need you to massage my ego. You see, that's, that's what Saul was saying. And it is the uncrucified self that, is giving, that was giving him that problem. I pray God will set us free. And sometimes you see this uh, unsanctified and uncrucified ego or I, self, uh, can be in one, two, three, five people at the same time. And then you'll find instead of the I, it's us. It's us. Not the word of God, us. It's not the standard, us. It's not the principle of righteousness, us. It is not sacrifice and devotion to the Lord, us. In uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 4. And they said, Go to you. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, of the whole earth. You'll see, although it's not an I, they have all grouped together. They edged God out, ego. And then he said, everything now is about us. This is what we want. This is what we are going to do. This is what we are going to build. This is what we are going to have. Aye. And except it is crucified. You see, whatever talent you have, the Lord will not be able to use you to the level he ought to use you. Except this eye is crucified. And whatever wisdom you have, you know there are people that have wisdom. Even, even we see people in the world that have wisdom in various areas, and you can tell the way they do things, even their secular work, that they have some wisdom, they have some charisma, they have some real possibilities in their lives. But because of this I, 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 that's the problem. Who will tell us that Absalom did not have talent? I'm sure that man had great talent. Who will tell us that Absalom did not have some kind of wisdom? For a man to be under David, and for that man to be able to get all the hearts of the people to himself, and for anybody to be able to turn the minds of people away from David, the great warrior, that man must have some kind of wisdom. But to see the kind of wisdom he had uh, was the selfish one, was the uh, one that just wanted everything for himself. Let me read it to you in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. So, you know, it's not just the wisdom we're looking at. It's not just the talent we're looking at. It's not just the great uh, possibilities we're looking at. We're looking at the man. We're looking at the woman. It's self-crucified. It's this ego crucified. It's this self, the self-life, the self-will, the stubbornness, the stiff neck. Is it totally crucified and crushed? We're looking at Second Samuel chapter 15 verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Where was David? David was in town. And David never knew anything about that. And you know, if a man could do this under David, and you know David was a great warrior. And David, uh, David actually had men almost everywhere that were telling me about this, about this. But Absalom did things in such a way that nobody told David anything. That man had some wisdom. And that man had some ingenuity. And that man had some courage. For anybody that was thinking about David, and know that David was a great warrior. That if David knows this, 
that this David he'll take me on and I don't think I'll be able to escape. And for him to still be able to do what he did, he had talent. Not only that, the great, the greatest counselor that David had, his name, who knows his name? Tell me out loud. How did Absalom do it? That he could get Ahitophel on his side secretly without anybody knowing about it and without david knowing about it and tell you that absalom had some talents but i self ego was not crucified and it was that lack of the crucifixion of that ego that made all his talent all his wisdom all his ambition all his desire everything that he had to just to perish look at verse 2 and absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, O war of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. But there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land. Oh, that I were made a judge in the land. And you know how clever he was? He wasn't saying, oh, that I would be made a king in the land. Everybody will say, ah, what are you talking about? Your daddy, your father is a king. So he used another language and he, he knew what he had in mind. In his own mind, the judge is a king. But if I use the language and I say, if I were made a king in the land, I know that the people are going to sense it. And there's no way they'll shift away from uh, David who killed Goliath. There's no way they'll shift away from David that overcame all the Philistines for the children of Israel. So I must be careful now about my language. That man was wise, but he had ego. He had self. And the eye was not crucified. What's your life? Watch your attitude, watch your conversation, and watch the things you say. Because you see, it will show. If somebody stays with you for one day, and the, the person can tell by the way you talk, by the things you plan, by the things you discuss, whether the eye is there or not, whether the eye is crucified or not. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, you, you ask, uh, Pastor, if you know that, why don't you deal with some of those uh, things in those people? No, we don't have to. David didn't have to deal with Absalom. God will do that himself. And David didn't have to handle Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses, rather, did not have to deal with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. He'll do that himself. And you, but if you want to be useful in the hand of God, there's this number one thing, which is I, that must be taken to the cross and crucified. It will be done. Oh, that I were made a judge in the land, that every man which has any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and he took him and skeezed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king. He will, start, he will stay between the place they are coming from and the king. And, and the king never noticed that actually the people that were coming to see him, that uh, they were getting kind of diminished. That they, they are not coming and they used to come before. He didn't even check up. But the man just felt, you know, I'm the king, I'm the king. That has anointed my head. And my cup runneth over. Surely now goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's what the man was staying upon. He was saying, I know I'm the anointed king. And I know that everything is all right. And nobody can actually take. Therefore, he just sat down there without coming out. David, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, it's good to come out. And then you will see all the egoistic people that are doing whatever they're doing. And then when you are coming, of course, they are going to change their style. And they're going to say what they have not been saying. It, because ego is still going to come out. But if the Lord gives you the spirit of God and you observe very well, you can tell. This isn't right. And I pray God will help us. Amen. I said God will help us. Amen. And when God helps us, there'll be a change in our lives. There'll be a change in our attitude. There'll be a change in everything that we do because that ego, that I, will be crushed out. And it says in that verse, in that verse 6, So Absalom stole 
Read it out with me. So Absalom stole. Read everything now from so. Uh, you know, uh, if somebody has stolen money, it will not be as serious as this. If somebody stole, uh, you know, some property, it will not be as serious as this, but to steal the hearts, the minds of the people. And to diverge their attention away from the anointed of the Lord. And then to steal the hearts of the people. And Absalom did not have anything to give them because he was not appointed by God. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You know, I can read the whole Bible to you without any illustration. You will not understand. If, for example, you have a pastor in a particular location. And every time when he finishes preaching, at the end of the message, you go to the members of the church and you are saying, huh, are you getting anything from this church at all? Are you benefiting anything? What do you think? If, uh, you know, see how the pastor is wasting our time. And see what you have been reading from the Bible. Even see, say, you know, the pronunciation, everything. What do you think? And the fellow be begins to, I didn't think of that before. You should ought to think about that. We are paying tithes to maintain this church. And this man is just there. And he's just talking blah, blah, blah and everything. And you know, if I were there, if I were to take the, that subject, that topic this morning, if I were to, you know, uh, go from introduction to first point, second point, and third point, and bring a conclusion, and wrap it up, I'm telling you, this person that we all live, and, and the fellow is saying, oh, it's true, I, I never thought about it. Oh, you need to think about that. And then you go to another person. Good morning. And is this your first time of coming to the church? No, I've been coming before. Hmm. Are you, when were you born again? I was born again, 19 such and such. Where? In Nigeria. Ah, wonderful. You mean you have been in deeper life in Nigeria since before you came? Yes, I've been here. And uh, since you'll be coming to this, our church here, in this, our location, in this America, compare what you are hearing, what, what you are hearing in Nigeria. Is it the same? I never thought about that. You should think about that. And then uh, it says, well, uh, you know, preachers are different. And, uh, you know, we, we have different talents and different gifts. I think our pastor is doing his best. What are you talking about? Preachers are different. The Bible is the same. The Holy Spirit is the same. And, uh, you know, the doctrine that you take people to heaven is the same. See the way the man is preaching. You know, if, we, if there's something God can do, it's not God, it's you doing it. It's something God can do. And remove this man. And we put, you know, I'm not recommending myself. I'm just saying, you know, we, even though we're humble, we should know the talent of God that we have. You know, if I were there this morning, and I were to deal with that thing, and I would do it like this, and like this, and like this, my friend, you're stealing the hearts of the people away. If God is going to promote you, you don't have to do that. If God is going to put you in place to do something in the kingdom of God, we don't have to belittle the other fellow, dethrone the other people, crush the other fellow, throw the other fellow away, and then he has been helping them. He prays in the night, he prays in the day, he prepares the message. Yes, I know what you are saying, that his message is not like if you were there. Wait until he comes to your turn. If the Spirit of God is not there, you'll be speaking to the air. Nobody will listen to you. But you know, if you just leave David where he is, your time will come. Your turn will come. We don't have to steal the hearts of the people away from these local pastors and overseers who are there. The Lord will give them their chance. The Lord will give you your chance. But you see, it's the ego. It's the I in these people that makes them to act the way they act. I'm looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 12, verse 17. And he thought within himself. That's, that's the problem. He thought, he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? It's I, because I, I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Then, and he said, this will I do. It's I, and I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take then, ease it, drink, and be merry. Can you see the man that is all self-controlled? Self, only self. 
projecting self. This is what I will do. This is what I will plan. And this is what I will carry out. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is so you see that lays up treasure for himself, for himself, and is not rich toward God. Galatians chapter 2 again. In Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. You know, as you look at the language of Paul the Apostle, he could have said, I was crucified with Christ. But he said, I am. In the present tense, in the present day, at this present time, with a present reality in my experience, I am crucified with Christ. He could have said, I will be crucified with Christ. You know, some people say, I'm walking at each. I'm not there yet. I'm walking at each. When are you going to get there? I am. At this very moment, I am crucified with Christ. I pray it will happen to us. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I live. That brings us now to the next point. Consecration to Christ. Consecrated to Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. 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 That means, now it's Christ that does everything. It's Christ that plans everything, but Christ that liveth in me. Christ that liveth in me, consecrated to Christ. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, that you present, that's consecration, that you offer unto the Lord your bodies, a living sacrifice. And the implication of that is the totality of your body, you offer unto the Lord. And when you do that, uh, that's more than offering money. You, you know, there are people that can offer money in the house of, and that's good. I want to encourage you to keep on doing that. But you know, you can offer money without offering your body. And you can offer money, and yet you are thinking about, this is my body. Praise the Lord. And you know, I, I think I told you before, because I've been coming here now for a number of years, that sometimes, uh, you know, what I discovered nowadays, if, for example, we, uh, I was looking at the program, that is, uh, the program we hold in our hands, and then I saw there the conference live, and then I felt... I, then a, a pastor from New Jersey read everything the first day and explained everything. And then you have it there. I think it's uh, number seven where it says, Let not thy nakedness be discovered. Thou shalt make them cover their nakedness. The woman ought to cover her head because of the angels. Let the woman adorn herself in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. She not with brooded air or gold or pierce or costly array. It's there. And we hold it in our hand every time. But you know, it's like, it's not there. And for some women, it's like, you know, sometimes when you, when you see the people, if, you know, if they're newcomers, you say they're newcomers, they don't know. And if they're, you know, people who have just been born again, they became born again about a month or two ago. And, you know, they dress in any way, well, the jewelry and everything you say, you know, we have to, we have to allow them to stay for some time. Because we will catch the fish before we clean the fish. And he told us, that's what uh, I think, uh, what uh, you learned in your seminar yesterday. But after catching the fish for one year, and for two years, and for five years, I've been seeing some of you since I started coming regularly. Since 2001, five years have passed. We have caught the fish, but we have not been given the chance to clean up the fish. And all the painting and all the, you know, palming and everything is still there. When are we going to clean up the fish? I said, when are we going to clean up the fish? Now in this convention, we'll do it. I said, we'll do it. And you know, sometimes, uh, you know, our teenage girls, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, they say they don't talk to teenage girls of this society. And you know, you're not of this society, you're citizens of heaven. 
And because of that, you know, you have your father in the Lord. And how can a father come into the house and then he sees all these teenage girls and you wear whatever you wear and you do whatever you do and we cannot talk to you. Your father must talk to you and children, daughters, we must listen. I said we must listen. And I pray that the Lord will help all of us so that as we look at the word of God, we say we want to get to heaven. If there is anything you know in the word of God, you are deliberately overlooking. And it's not only just the jewelry and the painting and the palming, it's also our attitude to one another. Our love with one another. Our interaction with one another. Our humility to be able to allow the other fellow to do what he needs to do so that we can be united together. There will be no ego. There will be no I. And there will be no friction and conflict between us. In Jesus' name. Consecration, consecrated unto Christ. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're not going to be in the perfect will of God except there is consecration. We're going to be consecrated to the Lord. And when we're consecrated like that, we lay everything upon the altar. And we say, Lord, here am I. Do with me how it pleases you. What's the language of a consecrated man? A consecrated woman in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 15. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 15, here is what it says. It says, And the king, the king's servant, said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. That's consecration. When you tell the Lord, and you say, Lord, I am yours. I'm born again. I'm converted. And I'm giving myself, surrendering myself to you. And then you say, you say Behold, thy servants are ready. Are we ready? Read it out with me. After two, you, once you go, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my Lord, the King, shall appoint. Read that again. Once you go. Praise the Lord. You know, that is the essence of the Christian life. That is the essence of the consecrated life. Behold, thy servants are ready. The servants are ready to do whatsoever the Lord, my, my Lord, the king, shall appoint. In 1 Kings chapter, chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 4. And the king of Israel answered and said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. That's the language of consecration. And I pray the Lord will do it in our lives. We're told in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah 26, verse 13. O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. All the lords have had dominion over us. From now on, you will be the only Lord. And will make mention of thy name. In Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Reading from verse 7 to verse 9. Romans chapter 14 verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself. And no man dieth to himself. For whether we live. We live unto the Lord. That's consecration. Anything we do. We do unto the Lord. Or, whether, or we die. We die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For lo, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. We go, come to point number three, commissioned by Christ. You are crucified with Christ. And then you are consecrated to Christ. And then the final step is to be commissioned by Christ. John chapter 15, commissioned by Christ. John chapter 15, reading from verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, 
that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It says, he has chosen us. And because he has chosen us, he is commissioning us that we will go and bring forth fruit. We'll be fruitful. Amen. Fruitful in ministry. Amen. Fruitful in the church. Amen. Fruitful for the kingdom. Fruitful in our business. And fruitful as well in our families. In Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. I'm reading from verse 15 and verse 16. Galatians 1. Verse 15 and 16, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. That's a commission now. Crucified, consecrated, and then commissioned. It pleased the Lord who separated me from my mother's womb. And he called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. That I might preach him among the heathen immediately. Everybody say immediately. immediately. Say it again. Uh, you know why the people in the earlier days, that is in the early church. You do you know why the Lord used them so much? Immediately. Because of that word immediately. God called Moses. Moses, Moses. Here am I Lord. Immediately. And God said, Moses, and not Joshua. Joshua, come on here. And immediately he responded. And then God was calling David again immediately. And God was calling Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Immediately he responded. But do you know why the Lord is not using many people today? Because they drag their feet. Because they are slow. Because they say, no, Lord, I still have my business. I still have my project. I still have my ideas. I still have some things I want to do. They don't want to do it immediately. The Lord is saying, surrender this sin. Get rid of this sin. Get cleansed and get crucified and get conquered by the power of the cross. Say, Lord, I'm still considering it. But you know the beauty of obedience is when it is prompt obedience. Immediate obedience. And it says, come. Get this area of your life crucified and call upon me. I want to use you. He will use us. It says in this verse 16, he wants to reveal his son in me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Obviously, that was a crucified man, a consecrated man. And because of that, he became a, a commissioned man. And the, it has come to us today. This is your own chance now. And the Lord is saying, I want to use you. And you, he wants you to put your life in his hand and say, Lord, here I am. What am I arguing about? What am I fighting about? What am I striving about? I surrender everything to you. I will be crucified. I will be consecrated. And I'm going to be commissioned. And the work of God will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And you're going to deal with this area of our lives crucified and then consecrated and then commissioned by the Lord. Let's rise up and let's talk to the Lord and say, Lord, now I am ready. Now I am going to follow you. I will not resist your word or your will anymore. I will not go my own way. Crucified. Consecrated. Commissioned. Is there any area of your life you've been struggling with the Lord? Is I standing at the center of your life? Are you here to do your own will? Are you here to do the will of God? What are you fighting about? Fighting for recognition? Fighting for exaltation? Do you want to take the place of Christ? Do you want to drop the Bible? And project your idea. Do you want to destroy the foundation that the fathers of faith have laid? 
Do you want to make yourself the standard? Or you want to come back to the word of God and say, Lord, not I, but Christ liveth in me. If we are truly converted to Christ, we will be crucified with Christ.